We're going to talk fireflies of Texas tonight. My name is Ben Pfeiffer. Um, I'm the founder of Firefly Conservation and Research. Um, I've primarily been studying fireflies here in Texas for the last uh, 12 years or so. Um, I'm primarily interested in documenting the life history of existing species here in Texas and then also discovering new ones. Um, a lot of fireflies in Texas here um, were previously described many, many years ago um, in the 18th, 19th century, 1940s and 50s, but they were only ever described uh, by just a, a simple specimen. Um, and a, a lot of their life history in terms of flash pattern, behavior, things that they do is relatively unknown. So uh, I'm illuminating a lot of that with my research. Um, I also contribute to uh, scientific publications and research that's going on with Xerxes uh, and the International Conservation for the Union of Nature. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, just to kind of give you a primer on fireflies in general, um, uh, fireflies are beetles. Uh, they're not flies and they go by a lot of different names. Um, you might know them as lightning bugs, just depending on where you grow up. Um, you might know them as fireflies. You might have a specific name that you had when you were you were growing up as well. Uh, sometimes somebody will point and be like, it's that glowy thing over there. Um, beetles are in the order Cleoptera and that contains over 400,000 species worldwide. So it's an incredibly diverse group uh, that makes up uh, Cleoptera. And all fireflies belong into the family Lampyridae. Uh, beetles in the family Lampyridae share several shared characteristics. And this is gonna be important later as we go through this presentation. Uh, but just to kind of uh, educate you a little bit, um, all fireflies, um, whether they're adults or juveniles, bioluminesce. Uh, so the larva bioluminesce, and then as adults, they obviously flash. Mm -hmm. Um, they all have self, relatively soft, elongated bodies. Sometimes we call these squishy beetles. Um, you know, some of you might remember as a kid, you know, you could squish a firefly between your fing fingers. Um, and sometimes we think of beetles as having like a hard exoskeleton, but fireflies um, are rather in that kind of squishy beetle uh, section. They have a flattened shield that covers the back of their head. Uh, this is uh, what we call a pronotum. And if you look in the picture up in the right hand corner, you'll see a firefly that's got a, a head shield as a orange and kind of a yellowish uh, kind of shield, and that's what a pronotum is. Um, and the head shield is usually large, shield-like, and has colorful markings on it. Um, yellow, tan, red, sometimes black spots. All of these things are just helpful for us to determine species. And most species of fireflies are around 5 to 20 millimeters long. Uh, just to give you an example, um, a 25 millimeter long firefly is about an inch or so, or larger, in the Amazon, in some of the parts of South America, they get up to about 45 millimeters long. So you can imagine a really giant uh, firefly beetle uh, down there crawling along. Those things can get kind of scary. Uh, this is just some brief information on the anatomy of a firefly, because a lot of times we see them flashing at night, but we really don't really know a lot about their morphology or the structure of how the insect's made up. Um, I won't go into too many technical details here, but uh, this is just helpful that they have. They have six legs. Uh, they have two antenna with uh, 13 segments each. Uh, they have uh, a pronotum or head shield uh, that I note here. They also have what are called a latra, and these are basically just their wing covers. And uh, they also have what's called an elatral margin. And this is an area that basically surrounds the elatra. And this is helpful for us sometimes as scientists in order to determine um, species sometimes. Some species have this yellow border, some don't, and so those are some of the things that we look at. Uh, this is a photo of a female firefly and a male firefly. Um, when I go out and I do firefly walks um, with groups and stuff like that, I like to, to spend time to try to educate people on a, a male versus female because um, a lot of people don't really know the difference. Um, off the bat, you can automatically see a few differences. Um, the female, for example, um, she's only generally has one spot here, and that's her light organ, whereas the male has two spots. Um, and the females don't need to produce as much light as opposed to the males. Uh, the males are highly invested in, in flashing to, to signal to females um, and want to be as kind of bright as possible, whereas the females just have to signal back to a, a, a male while they're posted on a branch. So next time you go out and catch a firefly, which right now is a great time to go out, um, we're kind of in mid-season, almost uh, the tail end um, of it. So it's a good time to go out. And if you catch one, turn it over and then see what it looks like on the side and you'll be able to determine whether it's male or female. 
Just some uh, diversity uh, numbers about uh, fireflies. There's around 2,000 species worldwide, and that's a lot. That's a big number. Um, to give you an example, um, a few years ago, they described a new species of firefly in Iran, for example. Um, and so they're all over the, the, the world and every continent except Antarctica. Uh, the U.S. has about 180 species, and there is speculated that there's about 225 possible out there total. In Texas, we've got about 45 species, uh, which is a high number. And in the Edwards Plateau region where we're at, we have about 20 species or so. Um, most people, a lot of people think that there's just one species. They go out, they look, they see something flash. And uh, what's really remarkable about the state that we live in is that the, we have such diversity. Um, Florida and Georgia are the next two states that have the highest amount of diversity with about 50 species. So we're right up there and it's really fortunate to have such bioluminescent diversity here in Texas. Just to give you a summary on the life cycle of firefly, uh, a lot of people think that they, fireflies spend most of their time as an adult, but the reality is, is that fireflies live as larvae for at least one to two years. Um, an example of what a larva of a firefly looks like is in your the lower right-hand corner on the screen. Um, and that's a, a larva that's crawling on the ground and they spend a, a large portion of their life in that stage. And as an adult, they really only live for about three to four weeks maximum. Um, they also spend three weeks in the pupa stage. This is the, 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 the stage between larva and adult. And then eggs really are only around for about three weeks. So when we talk about protecting fireflies or firefly habitat, a lot of times we're considering the larva habitat um, and protecting them specifically. Flash patterns. So we all know that fireflies flash and What's really fascinating about them is that each firefly species has its own fairly distinct flash pattern. And these flash patterns can vary in quite a number of ways. Uh, temperature is a big one. Um, if it's hotter, uh, flash pattern, they can fast uh, flash a lot faster. Uh, color can also vary as well. You've got a genus of Photinus that flashes a green color, a more of a yellow screen color. And then another genus called Pyractomena that flashes more of a uh, amber color. Number of flashes can vary as well as the interval of time between flashes. So this is basically, do they flash every once a second, every two seconds, or four seconds? Um, and then the time of night that they're active is also uh, something that changes their flash pattern as well. Um, sometimes as the night goes on, male fireflies will get a little desperate and start flashing a little bit faster. Um, the, the, the photo off to the right actually shows some good illustrations. Um, if you notice, you'll see some fireflies in that chart there, specifically number one, that's flashing kind of high in the treetops, whereas some of the fireflies uh, that, are, that look like they're flashing below, and number six and number five, flashing lower in the canopy. So the species will vary in terms of like where in the canopy it flashes. Now, if you go out at night, um, and you know some of this information, you can kind of narrow down what species might occur in your area based on where they're flying. So how do they choose a mate? Um, why are they flashing all in the first place? Um, basically, males are just broadcasting signals and searching of females, um, and they're trying their hardest to, to find one, get one to respond. Uh, females respond to this different intraspecific variation in male flash timing. Um, and they do this uh, in a very different ways. Um, and so generally I'll, I'll ask the audience in this, this, this point, um, what do female fireflies like in male fireflies? So if you have any ideas about that, feel free to post that in the chat and uh, see if we can. See if we can get any responses here. All right, so to give you an answer to that question, uh, females prefer longer flashes or faster flash rates, which is uh, pretty fascinating. So how do they make light? Uh, that's a question that uh, gets asked a lot. Uh, it's such a, a miracle of nature that an insect in general can to make light. They're a relatively rare thing in the animal kingdom that anything to make light. Uh, so how do fireflies actually do it? 
So this is uh, just a complicated chemical formula for the recipe for light. Um, and how they do it is uh, they combine three special substances in their photic organs to make light. Uh, and these substances are luciferin, it's a pigment, luciferase, uh, enzymatic catalyst, and ADP, uh, which is a nucleotide that a lot of y'all have probably heard before that provides energy to cells. And through this uh, formula, basically, in process, uh, they're able to, to process light. Now, in this uh, image here, um, off to the right is basically the luciferase enzyme with luciferase, luciferin inside. <laughs> And what happens is that fireflies control their flashing by the amount of oxygen that they breathe in. And so uh, luciferin within this enzyme basically is charged up when they breathe in oxygen. And as it charges up, it gets kind of, it gets very excited. And as that happens, uh, it will release uh, photons of light basically. Um, and then the whole process basically starts a bit over again. You can kind of think of it like minute miniature lightning. If you ever get a firefly and catch it, turn it over, look at it, and you'll see what it looks. It does kind of appear like miniature lightning. And basically it's these enzymes within uh, those light organs that are basically responding to oxygen and uh, doing it over and over again. So a uh, couple, uh, just an interesting slide about colors of light. Um, I mentioned this before about how fireflies can, uh, you know, have different colors. And some of it has to do with the actual uh, luciferin molecule itself. Um, it's slight changes in its structure can basically uh, change the light it produces. And off to the right is an example of uh, this where you can see yellow, orange, and red. And uh, just the differences in that enzyme. Um, and so fireflies are able to control this color in a variety of different ways. As I mentioned before, temperature can be helpful. Uh, time of night is also one of the things too. So earlier in the night, uh, fireflies are going to flash a little more yellow orange. And as the night progresses, they'll get a little bit more yellow green. And then males versus females. Uh, males might be more of a yellowish green and a female could be a little bit darker. And this varies per species. So how are fireflies helpful? Uh, generally, fireflies act as nature's pest control. Um, and that's one of the reasons that they're beneficial in the natural environment. Uh, the larvae are incredibly predaceous. So if, if you're a gardener or uh, a native pest uh, plant person, uh, having fireflies in your habitat is beneficial in that it helps control snails, earthworms, and dead insects. Um, some adult fireflies, such as Futuris, even eat other insects in their own kind as well. Um, generally, for uh, a lot of reasons, uh, fireflies act as a good indicator of the health of environment. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that if uh, the food that fireflies uh, eat basically don't exist in the environment, then you don't have fireflies. And they act as a, a really good signpost to basically say this is a, a very healthy environment and that uh, we have a very well functioning, a fully functioning uh, biological system going on here. And so uh, a lot of uh, people that uh, do a lot of riparian work and riparian surveys use fireflies a lot of times to assess their health. The environment. They've been medically useful as well, uh, food safety, cancer research, development of new drugs. Basically what they do with this is that they uh, are able to synthetically make uh, luciferin and luciferase in the lab and uh, they will uh, have uh, processes where they will test food safety for example. Um, you know uh, if uh, food has a particular type of uh, pathogen or bacteria then if they treat it it might the the chemical might light up. In cancer research, for example, if, if the tumor grows, it might light up. Those kind of things, very valuable. So uh, a question that I get a lot uh, in, uh, I talk about a lot on the website as well, is that, uh, you know, are fireflies actually disappearing? And this is a common thing. Um, we're concerned about a lot of species right now. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of species that are at threat and, and at risk right now, and fireflies are one of them. And um, unfortunately, they are disappearing. Um, there is, you know, some consensus among the public and scientific communities that there's a whole lot less fireflies than there used to be. Um, I think probably a lot of people in the audience could probably remember a time when they probably saw more fireflies than they used to, uh, where they could just go out and, and basically see fireflies more readily than they do now. 
Um, I would say there's been shifts in our culture as well in terms of the time that we spend outside is less. And so part of it is that we actually get outside less to actually see things. Um, but in general, uh, there is empirical evidence piling up to kind of prove that there are a lot less fireflies than there used to be. Um, for example, uh, there's around 14% of North American firefly species are now threatened um, and classified as either endangered, uh, critically endangered, or vulnerable. And uh, the 29% of fireflies, uh, North American fireflies, will eventually be uh, listed as threatened. So that's quite a lot and quite a large number. Um, what we do know is that there is urgent need for conservation of their habitats. That's where it starts. Uh, and if they don't have habitat to, to, to live um, and to reproduce, then we don't have fireflies. And as uh, especially this state, Texas, uh, gets more and more developed, um, we basically see less and less fireflies. And it's just, we're just wiping out their habitats. And that's why. Uh, of, of greatest concern, uh, especially locally here, is uh, our unique locally adapted species. And some of those I will talk about later. Uh, these are the, the species that occur just here in Texas. So let's go into some reasons why they're disappearing. So one of the first things is, is, is really pollution and loss of riparian corridors. Uh, riparian corridors are that interface between the water and the land. It's that narrow strip of vegetation that generally occurs along a creek river or stream bed. Uh, this image that I'm showing here on the screen, uh, pay attention to, look at it really closely. You're obviously seeing a shopping cart balanced on a canoe uh, with a guy holding it, but look in the background. Uh, and since I'm speaking to a group of native plant people, they might be able to recognize what this plant is in the background. Um, it is a rondo, uh, which is uh, a rondo dontax, which is cariso cane, sometimes it's called. Uh, this, this particular stream is, is San Felipe Creek in Del Rio, and uh, it is one of the most polluted uh, natural spring systems in the state of Texas right now. Uh, this was a photo that came from a cleanup about two years ago, and I just thought it was uh, really interesting uh, for the fact of what they're pulling out, and then also the, uh, the quality of the riparian habitat. Basically what's happened here, and this is a good example, is that uh, that Cariso cane in the background uh, is basically re replaced the, the native riparian habitat that once to, used to occur there. So at one time, uh, there used to probably be uh, a, a variety of firefly species that occurred here uh, that I have surveyed in Valverde County, but it has since disappeared from uh, the monoculture that's been created from this Arundo dontax or Cariso cane. So just an example of a one way and, and reason why they've disappeared. Habitat loss degrade degradation, talked about this before, but as more and more habitat disappears, there's just less land for uh, those species to exist. Um, and you get situations where, uh, you know, a lot of the species start to become uh, isolated. Uh, and uh, this is a, a, a photo from San Antonio where a developer came in and cleared some land, but didn't get permission to from the city, got in big trouble for it, and they did an aerial view on it. Uh, light pollution is another reason. Uh, steadily, light pollution is, is kind of increased over time. And the real reason that this is a problem is that uh, the light pollution basically interferes with males and females being able to see each other. So if a male is flashing at night trying to signal to females, uh, they potentially could have a hard time if there is light that is interfering for, with them being able to see each other. So if you've got really bright, for example, LED lights, uh, that are in a, a wide spectrum of white light, for example, that wash out all other colors. Um, it's going to make a female hard to see a male. Um, and so if they can't see each other, they can't, you know, mate and reproduce. Um, and there's no future generations that will get created. Pesticide use is another one, uh, specifically kind of broad spectrum pesticides is, is kind of the problem. Um, and this, this can be ap, you know, applied in the environment in quite a few different ways. Um, you might have seen, um, if you've been to uh, Home Depot or some other place like that, where they sell uh, you know, pesticides that, that kill lawn grubs or in beetles, basically. Well, a firefly is a beetle. So if you're spreading pesticide to kill beetles, you're killing fireflies, basically. So a lot of non-target species like fireflies end up becoming uh, susceptible to uh, this as well. Uh, so pesticide use is one of them. 
And lastly, disappearing water tables is, a, is another issue. Uh, this is just showing like a drought status um, from the area from a couple of years ago, uh, basically showing, you know, as uh, you know, aquifer gets pumped and we've got drought conditions, basically a lot of the surface water that was previously there is longer disappearing. And if there's not proper moisture in the soil, then fireflies can't exist there. So how to help? Um, there is uh, one of the first things that I recommend to people if they're wanting to restore fireflies into their habitat is to basically assess your soil health. Uh, poor soil equals poor habitat for firefly food, essentially. Um, as native plant folks, you, you, know, you know, good quality soil makes for good blooms and a variety of different things. So making amendments to the soil can help introduce nutrients um, and then attract that food, basically, if that fireflies need to eat. Um, you can also till your soil as well. Um, I've got questions before about how far should I till my soil? Well, the answer is what's ever best for you. Um, you know, it, you don't want to obviously go too deep to uh, interrupt things, but uh, the one of the reasons why this is beneficial is that uh, the firefly food, snails and worms are able to kind of get into the soil. Um, and that's one of the reasons why that's beneficial. Um, in uh, Manhattan, for example, um, in Central Park, they're actually able to keep a firefly population going in Central Park. And there's actually a, a guy that's devoted to tilling small sections of, of, of Central Park in order to encourage fireflies. And they do this by keeping these plots, basically, and they're, they don't allow anything else to grow in them. And they just till the soil and introduce nutrients and allow places for, for uh, fireflies to lay eggs. Uh, the city knows that people like fireflies in the middle of uh, Manhattan. So uh, they've in, come up with some creative ways in order to encourage that. Um, you can use uh, avoid use of broad spectrum pesticides, as I mentioned before, specifically lawn chemicals. Uh, turn out outside lights um, is helpful, especially if you're in a green belt area or anywhere near uh, where you might have fireflies already. Uh, turning out those lights can be really helpful. Um, advocating for local policies to control light pollution is another ex uh, recommendation that can be really helpful. Some cities and towns are a little bit more uh, Aggressive in terms of their approach to light pollution. Uh, for example, where I live in New Braunfels, um, you would not know that anybody knew it existed, whereas, you know, down the road in Dripping Springs, it's a dark sky community. So it can vary quite a bit. So contact your city government to suggest dark sky policies. Um, one I also like too is you can buy land to protect species. If you have the ability to do this, this can also be really helpful as well. Um, you know, you can act as a steward to the land to protect not only the land itself, but the species that live there. And that can be really beneficial. This has been shown to work quite extensively for people that establish conservation easements on their properties. Uh, you can let log and leaf litter accumulate, uh, plant trees, native grasses, um, grass and forbs help retain soil moisture, don't over mow your lawn. Uh, you can start a pollinator uh, garden or help restore prairies. Um, I've spoken up in North Texas and there is, um, you know, fireflies that occur in some of those systems up there. So those are great ways to, to do it. A lot of times establishing a pollinator garden can also be beneficial as a firefly garden as well. Uh, some of those plants uh, help serve double duty for, uh, you know, in, not only for butterflies and moss, but also for fireflies too. Um, and then lastly, you can help educate your neighbors. So just uh, gonna, we'll talk about firefly habitat a little bit, um, but I wanted to um, basically uh, show you some examples of firefly habitat in the state of Texas. Um, as native plant folks, I felt like, you know, you might like to see some examples of some places that I've been uh, that might be kind of interesting. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about some specific ways of, of how to think about a habitat and how to uh, encourage fireflies to it, that habitat so this is a Enchanted Rock in Gillespie County. Uh, and I was just there recently in May. And this is just an image of a dry stream bed at Enchanted Rock here. And what you'll notice um, in this example is a variety of, of canopy heights. Uh, you've got a rich uh, plant community on either side of the stream. Uh, there's some residual moisture that's happening here. And even though there's not water, particularly in this stream, it's still retaining and capturing a lot of moisture. 
um, and acting as a catchment essentially for a lot of the runoff. Um, and this tends to be, would be a good habitat for fireflies um, in that uh, they're able to, uh, females are able to access the soil and lay eggs on either side. Um, when you're considering, um, you're planting plants for fireflies, um, you kind of want to consider several things. Uh, you want to provide uh, mating habitat, essentially uh, trees and plants in variety of, of, of heights, basically, uh, so that fireflies can basically operate um, and, and flash at each other. Uh, the next thing is that you're trying to provide uh, habitat for females, um, and this is providing abundant soil for her to lay eggs, essentially. Um, going back to the point where I made where you, uh, tilling the soil, for example, um, if you have a hard compacted ground and a firefly lays an egg on a hard compacted soil, it's not going to do much. It's going to hatch and then it's not going to be able to, to burrow back into that soil. So having rich, rich soil and that is helpful. And so preparing, ha preparing habitat for females is, is good. Um, next image I'll show you, this is from West Texas um, in Fox Canyon Ranch in Jeff Davis County. Uh, this is a, a, a very protected canyon um, that I think like handfuls of people have only ever been to. I got a chance to hike into it. Um, it's great, it's good firefly habitat. You'll notice it looks a lot different than the last image I showed you. There's maple trees and some other things there, but also um, the, the, the height of the canopies of those trees helps create a lot of darkness at night, which is good. So beautiful, beautiful spot. Uh, this is Honey Creek in Guadalupe River State Park. Uh, you'll notice it's also different, quite different. This is more of a cypress uh, dominated uh, spring system. Uh, and uh, Honey Creek is, has wonderful fireflies. One of the things that the cypress trees in this particular um, image shows is that it creates a very dark environment at night, um, even so much so that the moon has trouble penetrating through. Uh, fireflies like this because um, it makes it a, a really uh, ample environment for their, their light to travel quite far. So a lot of times in this particular spot where I took this picture across the creek there, um, I see a lot of fireflies in that particular area. It's dark, it's got grasses, uh, there's some sable palm poking through, uh, and, and they kind of will flash back and forth between uh, either side of the, the bank there. And lastly, uh, this is a property in Travis County in Inner Beer ca Bee Cave. Uh, this uh, property had excellent fireflies as well. The landowners had spent some time uh, basically restoring this property with a wide variety of species. And they had told me that it, when they first moved to the property, this uh, creek basically had been, had a lot of flowing water. And then as the grasses grew, basically the creek started drying up. Um, and it's not that the water disappeared so much as that they were able to retain the water in their soil um, by the grasses on the side. And in Consequently, in doing so, they just created great firefly habitat and uh, great sugar habitat as well. <laughs> I uh, was tromping around in this habitat and got bit about a hundred times for some sugars, and uh, it was not very pleasant. <laughs> so, what's here? What's here in Texas? Uh, no, don't feel no need to write down all these species names, but I just put it in here as an example of uh, the species that are here in Texas and what you could expect if you wanted to pronounce them all. Um, we've got uh, several different uh, genuses that are uh, present here in Texas. Uh, the predominant three are Photinus, Futurus, and Pyrecomena, um, and then a couple others over off to the right. Um, but this is kind of what makes up our 45 species or so. There's a, a number that aren't mentioned here, um, but some of those are much more uh, rare. And what I'm going to talk about is some of the more common ones that we'll see. So the most commonly encountered genera that you'll find in Texas is known as the Photinus firefly. Uh, we've got around 15 to 20 species. Um, these occur all the way up in North Texas. Uh, in Paladura Canyon, all the way down to the border uh, near Brownsville. Um, and they are the ones that are gonna be the most numerous in the early evening. So if you go out tonight after this presentation, which I encourage you to do, um, walk out and the first fireflies that you're gonna see are Photinus fireflies. 
Uh, this is one of the also the only other genera's that's present both in the spring and the fall. Um, we're very fortunate here in Texas that we actually have two seasons of fireflies, spring and fall. Um, other parts of the nation in the United States, they only have one, and it's usually only for two to three weeks. Um, we get to see fireflies, um, you know, almost uh, nine months out of the year sometimes. So the, the predominant species in Photinus that you'll see is uh, Photinus pyralis. Um, this is the most common one in, in Texas. Uh, this one is a ubiquitous one that occurs from Texas all the way up to the Northeast in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, it uh, makes a distinctive J shape. Um, it's a, a species that is a habitat generalist, so it can occur in a lot of areas. It's the one that's gonna be most present in your backyard, for example, um, and in more suburban areas. Um, Pyralis is also found in, in more pristine areas um, uh, as well, but always in conjunction with other species. Um, and then as other more, uh, you know, unique species disappear, pyralis is generally the one that's only is left. So if you come across a habitat and you're like, you know what, there should be more firefly species here, um, and, it, and you only see pyralis, and that can mean indications that, you know, the, the habitat's compromised, it could be polluted, uh, there's a variety of different things that go on. Um, one thing to note, um, uh, in Texas, uh, we have a unique thing here. Um, a lot of the, the pyralis that we see actually lacks the black spot on the back of their head. Um, up in the Northeast and through most of those, you know, eight, nine states over there, most of all of the pyralis you see there always have a black spot, kind of a round pronotal spot, we call it. But in Texas, uh, it's often lacking, lacking many times. Um, so if you find a firefly without a black spot, um, doesn't mean that it's not pyralis. It just means it's the Texas pyralis. Um, genetic work was done recently, uh, last a couple years ago, I think. Um, and when they compared the, the species of pyralis that we have here and the ones in the Northeast, they found that the ones here in Texas were about 50% different, uh, which is fascinating, is that the fact that this pyralis has basically been evolving uh, slowly in a different direction over time uh, makes it interesting. And at some point, it will become something that's completely different. Uh, Photinus concesis is the next species that we have. Um, it's identifiable by flash pattern um, and abdominal segments. It looks very much like uh, pyralis. Um, and the differences is slight, light differences, but it flashes every two seconds as opposed to every four seconds. I'm going to show you some video here. Um, this is actually taken in Austin. Uh, this is in actually off Zilker Park um, near the Violet Crown Trail, I believe. Um, if anybody wants to go and look at fireflies on the next couple nights, I encourage you to walk down this particular path. Um, it is was absolutely wonderful this year, best I'd ever seen it. Um, and I'm going to show you some really cool video showing some synchrony of firefly flashes, which I think you'll find very interesting. Um, so check out this path. Uh, just fair warning though, this path um, has a ton of poison ivy everywhere. I mean, littered, like if you step off the path, you get poison ivy. So watch out. All right, here we go. So if you'll notice that there's kind of like a, a slight synchrony that, that happens with the flashes. And basically what's happening here is one male is going off and it's triggering the other males. And they're kind of accomplishing almost a, a synchrony in a way. It is absolutely beautiful to, to, to see, especially when it's dark and they're doing this all at once and there's hundreds of them. Hey, Ben, are, are those uh, the lights up in the sort of the upper left-hand side, are those the females watching the males? Um, I think you're uh, the ones up like in the corner here. Um, yes. Those, there's some, there's some white spots up there and that's just kind of uh, like light poking through the trees there. Um, the females uh, will generally be down here in the bottom of, of along either side of the path. I actually found two females when I was there um, a few weeks ago when I took this video. 
Um, and they were generally down here on the right, like perched on a particular, um, like a branch or something. And if you uh, see, you know, females, you'll generally see them. Um, and what they'll do is they'll flash once. I don't see any females that like stick out to me in this uh, example here, um, but um, it's possible that they could be there. But generally, no, you'll see them in down here. That's a good question. So just a beautiful example. Um, fire, filming doing firefly photography is actually really difficult uh, because their light is rather dim and it's hard for cameras to capture it. Um, so the fact that I was able to get this uh, video is just really remarkable. It's the, some of the best I've ever captured of this particular species. So um, in, the, in the video you just saw, this is what the fireflies look like that you just saw in that video. Uh, these are from a different habitat, but it's the same species. Um, and you'll notice um, they, they're, you know, cute little guys. They, uh, they've got, uh, you know, uh, dark wing covers like this. I uh, can see cis flashes every two to one second. Uh, this is what a female of that species looks like. You're probably going, Ben, these look all look alike. <laughs> And you would be right to assume that until you spend enough time to study them and look at them closely. So this is a, a next species that you'll see. This is a species that occurs um, a little bit more in West Texas. So if you go anywhere um, about west of I-10 uh, towards Valverde County, so Bandera, uh, Kendall County, those kind of areas, this is a species that you'll see. Um, this is a, a firefly that flashes really fast, very reactive. Uh, they can do kind of flash swarms where hundreds of them will flash at once. Um, I've seen them do amazing things, um, you know, just remarkable things. I've seen several hundred of them all flash at one time um, from the spark from a candle. Uh, just, just a neat little firefly, but incredibly small, about five to nine millimeters long. This is what females of that species looks like. Um, really interesting. Uh, She's uh, got reduced wing covers here. Um, and this is just over time has uh, slowly evolved to basically uh, not need them. Uh, she's primarily invested in uh, egg laying, as you can see. Um, she has some really beautiful coloration. Um, I took out the slide where I talk about this female um, a little in detail, um, but she's about the size of a grain of rice. And uh, she had, uh, had not been ever photographed until just two years ago. Um, I was able to find this uh, uh, species, um, actually this comes from Valverde County, um, but uh, had never been really photographed before and nobody knew what she looked like. So um, y'all are some of the first people that get to see this particularly, and it's pretty cool. These are fireflies that also occur at the base of cedar trees um, that are kind of outside the riparian corridor. So as um, areas where, uh, you know, predominantly, you know, have a darker forest or have cedar and stuff like that, they get wiped out. These are some of the species that get affected most, um, primarily because they can't fly. So if you look at this female, I mean, you know, she's not going anywhere with those wings. Um, and so uh, if her, she gets bulldozed or wiped out, then she can't lay eggs and then, you know, she's gone. Uh, this is just a quick size comparison between the two species I just showed you uh, previously. And just to uh, show you, it was incredibly hard to get two fireflies posed right next to each other. <laughs> uh, talk about hard. Uh, they're crawling around. They don't want to stop. Uh, so this was, it was hard. But you can see the size difference is quite dramatic somewhat. Uh, this is uh, the last of the Photinus. Uh, Photinus texanus is, is one that's common. Um, a little bit in, in more um, like uh, preserved habitats. And it's one that you'll see uh, kind of darting about flashes every two seconds. It just varies. Um, and the female flash is kind of unknown. We haven't found a female of her yet, but I've been looking. And uh, this is one that occurs kind of primarily in Texas and in Northern Mexico. It's one of our, our, our state staples, so to say. So uh, to test your knowledge, um, if you've been listening, let's see if you can put that to work. Um, so what likes to eat fireflies? Um, I'm gonna give you a couple seconds to think about that. Um, and I'll give you a clue uh, on, what, on what that might be. I'm gonna show you an image. Um, and this image basically is going to illustrate um, 
a something that's trying to eat a firefly and it is perched between some branches and in this image what's happening is that a firefly saw something caught in something and thought it was a female signaling to it and she came he came along um, basically to then inspect what was going on and kind of circled around this particular thing and then basically dropped. So um, if you have any uh, thoughts on this, just feel free to post that in the chat. So uh, I'll give you a hint, it's not a bat. It's not a cat. All right, the answer is spiders. Uh, spiders are uh, one of the big predators of firefly at night. And you might see sometimes if you're hiking in the evening, you'll see something caught in a web that's flashing. Uh, and you're like, oh, look, there's a firefly on that leaf there. And then you get closer and it's firefly that's basically been eaten. Um, and they'll just kind of flash slowly as they dissolve. Um, and uh, this image here was a very rare image. What happened was uh, a female, or uh, not a female, I'm sorry, a firefly got caught in a spider's web. And what it did was it, it was kind of issuing this SOS, it was flashing once a second. And what happened was uh, another firefly, uh, possibly another genus, thought that it was a female firefly and went in to inspect. And so what we can see here in this flash trail is that it's coming in, basically, it circles around it, and then it lands on the web and then it basically uh you know basically drops from the weight of it and that's this little like uh little streak here in the middle so uh, a, a image of something that like probably never been captured before um but uh just really really cool thing so um Futurus fireflies these are ones that uh will occur kind of in late May um, to late June here in Texas. They're out right now. You can go and see them. Um, they're huge. They're big. Uh, they're 10 to 18 millimeters. I've seen ones that are 25 millimeters. Um, you know, if these things were the size of house cats at night, people would be afraid to go outside at night. Uh, they're, uh, they're a bit, they're predatory. Some of them are. Um, but Duris has also contained some uh, species that are known as femme fatale fireflies. And these are fireflies that like to mimic the flash pattern of other species. And they do this to acquire compounds um, that, uh, that makes them poisonous and they need to provision to their eggs. So they will try to eat photinous fireflies so that uh, they can take that compound to make themselves poisonous and also give that chemical to their eggs so, so that those things don't get bit or eaten, I'm sorry, from spiders or birds or whoever else wants to kind of mess with it. Um, so just a quick uh, interruption here, just something interesting. Um, can anybody imagine what one of the most complicated firefly flash patterns in the United States is right now? Um, about a year ago, uh, a woman published um, a, a new species um, out in Mississippi. And uh, she basically found this uh, species of Futurus that had this really complicated flash pattern. So I thought it was interesting to bring it up because uh, we're normally it usually uh, see fireflies that just kind of flash once and over and over and over. But what happens if you're a really complicated firefly? Um, what, what's, what's your business about? So uh, this is what the most complicated firefly flash pattern looks like right now. Um, so uh, quite busy. Um, basically, what they do is they flash uh, five to six times, uh, followed by a pulse and then another two flashes, and then another glow. So um, that is kind of in the, the, the range of just being super complicated. Um, and part of this is just has to do with sexual selection in the animal kingdom. Females have basically been selecting for males for quite some time with these very complicated flash patterns. Um, and so a lot of times the males with the most showy flash patterns in this example, sometimes are what's the females gonna respond to. And so it's driven, these fireflies uh, to come up with quite a, a, an array of flash pattern tricks, essentially, uh, to impress a female. And so we see this in the animal kingdom within birds and other things, plumage, things like that. It also occurs in fireflies in some cases. 
this is what it's called Fetoris waldoxi. It's in the swamps of um, Mississippi. Um, and uh, it's possibly could be in Texas, don't know, and maybe parts of East Texas. Uh, this is one of our resident uh, Futurus. Uh, it's, it's named Futurus catrinae. Um, it is uh, what we call the big scary predator fireflies. Uh, they are widespread in all of Texas. Uh, the pattern's very erratic. Uh, you, this is one that you really can't ID based on flash pattern. Um, you can only do it with a male flash. Um, and so uh, even doing uh, dissection or morphology is really difficult too, because they all look alike. So very complicated. But if you look at the images off to the right, uh, you'll see uh, you know, the, those fireflies that are pictured there look a lot different than the ones I showed you earlier. Um, they've got large claws. Um, they've got a humpback position. They generally look like predators in some ways. Uh, they have some mandibles here for chewing things. Uh, so I've had them or I've held them in my hand and I go, this firefly is going to bite me and then it bites me. <laughs> and so uh, it doesn't like to be held. Uh, this is what uh, Futuris uh, cat Renee will kind of does at night. Um, since they're very erratic and they also eat other fireflies, what they will do is that they fly black and forth, basically um, broadcasting signals. Um, and they can be in a couple different modes. They can be hunting, for example. Uh, they could be looking to signal to males. Um, generally, the females are ones that do a lot of the, you know, the, the mimicking and the flash pattern because uh, they're the ones that are looking to eat those compounds so they can provision it to their eggs. Um, this image just shows a time lapse basically of where uh, the fireflies have, have, have basically been kind of, you know, uh, meandering around um, and doing a variety of different things. It's very interesting because I can see, you know, some stuff that's going on here and uh, this like multi-layered image shows, um, you know, fireflies that are flashing over the treetops here. So that's what that, this is what that kind of looks like. Uh, this is the next species. Uh, and I just have like one or two more and then I'll be done with the species stuff. Um, the tourist bill brown eye. Um, this is one of our rare species in Texas. Um, it is one that's prone to habitat disturbance, like some of the other, a couple of the other ones I mentioned. This is an amazing firefly that's rarely uh, seen. Um, it has a double flicker flash. Um, it is beautiful to see. Um, it is also known to potentially synchronize its fire uh, flash as well, which most people don't know. Um, it's seen in the kind of mid evening. Um, right now would be a good time to see this. Uh, you will only see this species in areas that have like not been disturbed. Um, so if you go to a campground along the river, you won't see this. Uh, you'll have to go outside of that campground to an area where it has some trees. They like to flash in um, kind of ditches or uh, like sunken areas near next to roads. So they're often, I often will see them flying like right next to some trees. So it's just right next to a road basically. And it just cause they like that open area to flash. Um, you'll notice that they look a little bit different than the, the previous ones that I showed you. Uh, and this one, you can see that's a little more stout. And then back to this one, you have like smaller legs. So really kind of neat firefly. Lastly, uh, pyractamina fireflies. Now, if you go down to the coast right now, if you go down to Port Aransas or uh, O'Connor or something like Port O'Connor or something like that, these are the fireflies that you're going to see. Um, I've been doing some, uh, seeing what people have been posting on iNaturalist, and a lot of them, they've been posting uh, pyractamina lately. And I've been, uh, they've been misidentifying them as uh, a photinus. And, um, you know, this is a predominant one that will, you see down there. They're often found near water, kind of swampy habitats. Uh, they're mainly abundant in their coastal regions um, and eastern regions of Texas, and they're known for their kind of amber colored flashy flash pattern. Um, these are ones that you will only see in singly or in just in small groups. They're not found in large groups like other, other genera. Uh, this is what they kind of look like. Um, you might not be able to tell off the bat that it looks any different than the, the other images that I showed you, but uh, they are slightly different. Uh, you'll notice that their head shield's a little bit more pointed um, and uh, just uh, the, the pronotal spot uh, or the head shield spot basically looks like a little triangle. Um, 
So they're they're seen early in the evening um, in strong amber flash. They kind of a brief flicker every four seconds or so. Um, so just keep an eye out for them. They're really fun to see and pretty to see. Um, and then there's a couple other firefly species in Texas, um, and then I'll be done. Um, we've got a species called Pleiotomus palins. Um, these are ones that you will see the glowworm larva a lot of times. Uh, these are uh, fireflies that um, are rather non-luminous um, for most of their adult life. They are luminous once they pupate um, and come out at night. Uh, initially, you'll see them glow a little bit, but later on they use pheromones to, to see each other and that's characteristic of their kind of feathery antenna here. And um, over off to the right, it's just a really cool thing, really, really cool thing. So um, last July, um, at, somebody was down in Cameron County, in Brownsville, and was doing some research on birds. And she went into the bathroom and saw this really weird looking creature. And it turned out to be this really rare species of firefly down there. Um, and it, it had only been sighted in Texas really about four times since 1935. So it got some people excited. I was really curious. I ended up talking to the girl in, in more detail. She went back the next night, couldn't find it. Um, just a, a really neat thing. Uh, there's some speculation out there. It's like, did this come from Mexico or is this actually here in Texas? Um, and it's kind of hard to say a little bit, but uh, there used to be, these used to occur actually in the uh, Permian Basin area uh, near Monaghan Sand Dunes, um, but due to aquifer pumping, their habitat has basically disappeared and they basically have kind of disappeared themselves. And any surveys uh, to, to discover them have um, not shown that they are exist. So they're, they're, they're likely extinct, um, but uh, some of these are still out there. So keep your eyes out. So I just wanted to thank y'all for attending and uh, you know giving me the opportunity to speak to y'all tonight. Um, feel free to post any uh, questions you might have in the uh, chat section and I'll answer those quickly. Um, feel free to contact me. Um, this is my email um, and text message works really good um, as well if you would like to reach out. Um, and please visit my website at firefly.org um, to check out more information. I have a firefly field guide and more detailed information on plants specifically um, and the, the plants to plant in Texas. Uh, you'll see that. And uh, if you like my presentation, consider making a donation on the website. It helps to support my research and my speaking. I don't make any money doing this whatsoever. Um, this is all my volunteer time. So just wanted to thank y'all. And then I will. Uh... So yeah, thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. That was just really fascinating. Um, we do have some questions um, in the chat box. And um, I think Jackie, Jackie O'Keefe, actually Jackie, you had like a few questions. So you might wanna go ahead and just directly ask all your questions and, and, and ask, you know, ask Ben your questions. Okay. I've got... Um, all right. Uh, first off, I, I didn't really understand. I, I thought maybe the larvae you spent some time above ground, but it sounds like they spend most of their time on the ground and then in the ground. That's a great question. Yeah, and it's good they picked up on that. Um, some... Um, it depends on the genus of the firefly. So the, the Photinus ones, the ones, the common ones that I told, I mentioned, they will actually exist in the soil a lot more. And if you actually want to find one, you have to really dig into the soil. Um, other species like Pleiotomus palans, the one I mentioned right at the end, um, those larvae like to crawl on the ground and eat dead insects and other things that are crawling. Um, I've seen them in like, you know, large, large quantities and, you know, bet on them, like see who can cross the log the fastest <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> uh, so it, it definitely varies quite a bit. Um, and so, uh, but no, that's that's a good point. Uh, but for the most part, uh, probably about 80% or more like the kind of leaf litter soil kind of stuff. And it makes sense. You don't see them as often, right. you know. Mm -hmm. So my, my second one was, um, you've talked about um, temperature and I was I, not clear whether you meant temperature by color temperature or temperature by degrees in the air temperature. When you were um, no, that's a good question. So uh, I meant uh, temperature by like like air temperature. Air temperature, okay. And then the third thing you were talking about the males making all the patterns and stuff, but how do the females uh, find one? I mean, how do they find the females? I guess, or how, how does the female? I'm not quite sure what the, yeah. how they made make the final connection. 
Give me one second. I'm gonna I'm plugging my laptop in. I had to make some last minute changes, so. Okay. Okay. So, so it seems like the males do most of the flashing, but the females select the males. So how do the females finally find a male? That's, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so they do this by, they'll, they'll be posted on, a, on a, like a branch, for example. And if you go out into the habitat at night and look for this, um, she'll tilt her abdomen uh, towards like a male, basically. Um, oh, and, you, okay. and you can see her do this, actually. If you catch one in a jar, she actually does this like almost by instinct. Um, uh -huh. So she'll, 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 you know, push her light organ basically into direction of where she wants to signal. And uh, the male that picks it up, basically, um, you know, they're very attuned. She'll, she'll, he'll see that and he'll fly to her immediately. And she might attract other suitors, so to say. I've seen it happen where, you know, she's signaling to potentially one, but five show up and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, I used to catch jars full of those when I was a kid. I grew up in upstate New York, so I, I, I am kind of curious about these guys. Yeah, um, I wanted to answer one question. Somebody, uh, Joanna, had posted about plants uh, here in Austin to support fireflies. So um, I'm going to share my screen again really quickly, and I'm going to show you where you can get this information. So uh, on the on my website on firefly.org, there's a section in here uh, like plants for fireflies, um, and this will have some information about the types of plants that are really helpful uh, to planting. Um, I have to confess, I had spent all afternoon working on a custom presentation for you guys regarding these plants, and um, that the presentation actually didn't end up saving um, because my laptop ran out of space. Um, and so, cause I'm on a really old, I'm an older laptop. And so, um, unfortunately didn't get to put all these in here, but we're here now and I can show you actually have all this information on the website. Um, and there's two things to really pay attention that really help fireflies is, um, inland sea oats and Eastern gamma grass. Um, these are ones that I see over and over and over in really good firefly habitat. Some of them do well in, uh, plantings, but these are ones that, really, really do great. Um, I'd point out also, um, Forbes are also potentially good too. Uh, any native kind of, um, you know, asters, for example. Um, and then well, trees and some woody plants also can be helpful as well. Um, sycamore tends to show up in a lot of areas with, with fireflies, um, but you really just want to create habitat that helps increase leaf litter and that kind of sort of thing. It doesn't have to be super dark, as I mentioned earlier, but you know, just a variety of habitats um, or canopy heights, essentially. So you can get this on firefly.org. Um, and then there's some information about priorities and why we're planting and what we're doing here. So a couple other questions here. Uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, we, we addressed the larva. Um, where are fireflies and immature fireflies in the daytime? Uh, Steve Poole asked. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so one of the reasons why I suggested uh, gamma grass or the inland sea oats and some of those native grasses is that the fireflies actually will hide in between blades of grass. Um, and so that is like where they will tend to spend their time um, or at the base of a tree, for example. So, and, and, and some of it makes sense. It, it, you know, they, they can wedge themselves in there. Um, the bases of clumps of grass and other things kind of hold good moisture at the bottom in the soil there and as the moisture evaporates during the day it keeps it cool um, and so uh, a lot of times you'll see them kind of emerge from those little areas sometimes they'll hide underneath rocks for example um, I, I know a, a, a really well-known famous firefly researcher in the northeast and she basically goes along stream systems like turning over rocks all the time <laughs> And so it looks completely weird, but uh, she, it's where she finds a lot of interesting things. And that's where they, they sometimes are. So let's see, moving on to the next question. Um, George Miller asked, did you mention if the populations are stable? Uh, that's actually a good question. So I just did some research um, or did a lot of work this past six months with uh, the Xerxes Foundation or the International uh, Union for the Conservation of Nature. They're an organization that does species risk assessments to determine whether species are at risk or threatened. 
Um, and they look at, they're looking at all the species across the entire world and getting um, subject matter experts, like in my case, I do fireflies in Texas uh, together uh, to uh, basically assess what's going on here. Um, in Texas here, um, we just now for the first time have a couple species that are listed as threatened. Uh, one that I didn't mention in the presentation, but it occurs kind of from here all the way up to the north part has disappeared quite a bit. Um, and uh, I'd encourage anybody if they were interested in more information on that, uh, is that they can uh, go to, uh, uh, let's see, uh, IUC in red list. And you can basically put in uh, the species that you're, you're interested in. And in this particular case, uh, This is one that I, I named the two-step flasher because it's got a, a, a two-step um, or double flash, kind of like the Texas two-step. And it's, it's, it's near threatened right now. So uh, we, uh, it occurs in this particular area here uh, of Texas. And so we, just, we did an assessment and it's de decreasing. So uh, I would say that if you're concerned about the, the population, go in here and, and check it out. Uh, and you can find my research in here specifically. Okay, any more questions? I think that's it, isn't it? Anybody have any more questions? Awesome. Well, guys, thank you all so much for giving me an opportunity to speak tonight. And um, I just want to say I love speaking to NIPSOC groups. I have spoken to you guys more often than anybody else. And you're always great audiences. And I miss getting to speak to you all in person, but hopefully we'll be able to get to do that one day. Um, and I always like to, to create a new presentation for you guys every time I do it. So um, hopefully if you come back and see me again, you'll learn something completely new.